Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second plenary session. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Drusi Borowitz is known to most of you already as a thought leader who's made many contributions in the field of CF, both in pulmonology and gastroenterology. She's a professor at the, of pediatrics at the State University of Buffalo, where she's been the CF Center Director for more than 20 years. drusi has been a lead investigator on numerous national and international CF trials and is the national PI on a longitudinal study evaluating the study of nutrition and growth in babies with CF. Uh, we rely on Drusi extensively at the CF Foundation, particularly the Therapeutics Development Program, where she uh, helps us particularly with nutritional issues, but she goes well beyond that. Uh, she's a, a very savvy, wise uh, consultant and has helped us in too many ways uh, to count. Drusi is a beloved friend to the CF community. I think it's clear that her entire career demonstrates her deep commitment to improving the lives of individuals with cystic fibrosis. You're in, a treat, in for a treat today. She talks about GI issues and cystic fibrosis. Drusi, we want to thank you so much for willingness to do this today. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. Uh, as I stand up here, none of us in the CF world, neither clinicians nor researchers nor families uh, with an individual with CF, uh, do this on our own. So I, I want to thank my team that has supported me. And in particular, I would like to dedicate this plenary session to Mary Contos, the longtime nurse coordinator at our center who uh, is dealing with some personal health issues with the same grace and fortitude that she shared with our patients over the years. Uh, today, today I'm going to talk with you about advances in gastrointestinal aspects of CF, or as it was called in every single preliminary thing, GI. So let's talk a little bit about GI. And I hope you will gain some insights into gastrointestinal aspects of CF. So I hope to um, help you recognize similarities between the respiratory and GI tracts, to understand the CF pathophysiology in the GI tract, to compare findings of CF animal models and CF infants to understand a little bit about the development of gastrointestinal problems, and to learn about some new technologies to explore CFTR dysfunction that really speak to both the respiratory and the GI tracts. And I have uh, nothing to disclose in terms of this talk today. Most of you have seen a slide similar to this before, talking about the pathophysiology of lung disease in CF, this cycle of infection and obstruction and inflammation that leads to the lung disease that all of us deal with every day. I hope to explain to you that a very similar pathophysiologic uh, cycle is also present in the GI tract, and that has to do with the similarities between these two systems. Uh, let me remind you about a little gestational information. As you recall, the respiratory and the GI tracts have the same embryologic origins. So the uh, respiratory diverticulum buds out from the foregut, and ultimately they separate into the esophagus and the rest of the GI tract, and the trachea with the lung buds ultimately becoming the lungs. And so the histology of these two organ systems is similar, and so is the pathophysiology. Uh, in the lungs, clearance of obstruction and infection is uh, based on several things. At the mucosal level, airway surface liquid hydration and mucociliary clearance uh, help move particles. You saw that beautiful video that uh, Dr. Rowe showed yesterday in his plenary. Cough is the mechanism for bulk clearance in the airways. 
and there are antimicrobial peptides in submucosal glands that help fight infection. There are very similar mechanisms in the GI tract. So along the intestinal mucosa, the microvilli uh, and luminal hydration are important uh, for the health of the GI tract and to keep things moving. The bulk movement in the GI tract is through peristalsis. And there are also submucosal glands that secrete antimicrobial peptides. Well, let's talk a little bit about normal GI tract physiology. In the airways, you have epithelial tubes, epithelial lined tubes, uh, and the good air goes in, the bad air goes out, and that helps with gas exchange. In the GI tract, you have an epithelial lined tube, which is one directional, uh, and so the other thing that's different is that there are specialized areas of that one directional tube, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. And in addition, what's different is that there are two large glands, the liver and the pancreas, that add their contents to the GI tract. And that happens in this very important nexus right after gastric emptying where the common bile duct brings in secretions from the liver, secretions from the pancreas, and mixes it with food to have optimal digestion and absorption. I'm not going to talk uh, about liver disease, uh, but I do have one slide that I want to share with you about CF-related liver disease. So CF-related liver disease is a spectrum of a variety of different problems. But the thing that concerns us most is focal biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Those are the complications, the liver complications, that can ultimately lead to patients needing liver transplants. One thing I want you to walk away understanding is that of the 5 to 10 percent of patients who develop focal biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension, that that begins in the first decade of life. It is a very early phenomenon. And we don't see it, we don't recognize it usually until later in life because we haven't had good tools to do it. Transaminases are not particularly helpful. They go up, they go down. They don't really have much correlation with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And the converse is also true. Patients with well-established cirrhosis may have totally normal transaminases. So in a wonderful collaboration between the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the NIDDK, a study called PUSH has been underway for a couple of years uh, and will extend for a five-year period to look for some early markers of liver disease. And this will be very helpful to us so that we can recognize when liver disease happens in this first decade of life and hopefully be able to intervene. We also think it will give us some markers so that we can actually study interventions to uh, modify liver disease in patients with CF. The liver ducts uh, secrete bicarbonate, uh, but the pancreas is the major organ that secretes bicarbonate. And I want to spend a little time talking about bicarbonate. Um, it's important to neutralize gastric acid. The stomach, this one specialized area of this long epithelial lined tube, has lots of acid that it dumps into that very critical area high up in the GI tract. And bicarbonate is secreted both uh, via CFTR and through a CFTR-driven bicarbonate chloride exchange. That same exchange also happens along the GI epithelium, especially in the specialized glands called Brunner's glands that are in that space between the pylorus, the exit from the stomach, and where the pancreatic and biliary secretions come into the GI tract. So that part of the tube is very specialized to secrete bicarbonate. And I will point out to you over time uh, various abstracts and symposia that are focusing on this, and um, so I, I point you out to Abstract 126 and a symposium that will take place on Saturday, Symposium 15. Why is bicarbonate important? Why are we talking about it? So bicarbonate secretion is important because, as I mentioned, it neutralizes gastric acid. And the reason there are these specialized areas very proximal in the GI tract is because the pH optimum for 
uh, pancreatic enzymes, especially lipase and protease, is a neutral pH. And it's also important for micelle formation. So here's a little diagram of what happens when you eat dietary fat, which is in the form of these triglycerides, uh, fatty acids on a glycerol backbone. Lipase divides that into free fatty acids and beta monoglycerides. And the liver secretes bile, these little things that are, look like sesame seeds here, to help form micelles, which are important to transport fat across the intestinal mucosa. So unlike digestion of other uh, nutrients, fat has this two-step process. And both of these are affected by abnormal pH. So lipase won't work if it is in an acid environment. And these bile salts will precipitate and won't be there to help form micelles and help the action of lipase and colipase. Another action is that bicarbonate allows mucins to unfold and to hydrate. It also promotes bacterial killing, and there are some uh, great abstracts on this. And some of the abstracts that I'll point out to you, some of them are related to the GI tract, and some of them are related to the respiratory tract. But the mechanisms are the same. The mechanisms are the same. Another function of bicarbonate is that its secretion is equivalent to fluid secretion. And we talked about how important hydration is both in the airways and in the GI tract. And in every animal species or every um, mammalian species ever studied, bicarbonate drives secretion. So if you don't have bicarbonate secretion, you won't have fluid secretion. The normal human pancreas secretes one to two liters of fluid a day. Um, there are several liters of fluid secreted by the GI mucosa. And those uh, fluids are important to help keep flushing things in that uh, or rad to uh, distal uh, direction of this one directional epithelial line tube. A little something about the pancreas. So the pancreas has two different but uh, connected jobs. One is to secrete bicarbonate and with it fluid, and the other is to secrete pancreatic enzymes, and they come from different stimuli. So secretin stimulates the duct and the cells that are in the duct, uh, including cells that have CFTR action, to secrete bicarbonate and therefore to secrete fluid. Cholecystokinin, a different hormone, stimulates the acini to release their granules to, uh, that contain enzymes. And they have to get washed through the duct, of course, to get into the GI tract. But two different functions and uh, two different stimuli. So if bicarbonate is important, how could you measure it? So we have this tool, um, a pH pill. It's a pill that you swallow. It's one use. You swallow it, and when it comes out that one directional tube, you flush it away. It measures pH and pressure and temperature, and it's uh, single use, as I mentioned. And you wear this little radio frequency detector outside the body so that as the pill is passing through, the radio frequency detector can pick up those signals about temperature and pressure and pH. I'm going to show you some data that um, have been shown at this meeting before about acid neutralization in patients with CF compared to people without CF. So these are adults with CF. Uh, who are all pancreatic insufficient. None of them are taking any uh, acid-suppressing medicines. And um, in the healthy control patients, after leaving the stomach, when the pill gets into the small intestine, within a very short period of time, the pH is between 5.5 and 6. And those little dotted lines are there because uh, that is the pH optimum at which the coating of pancreatic enzymes dissolves. And um, it also is a pH optimum for enzymes. And in healthy individuals, as, uh, as uh, the pill passes through the GI tract, the pH uh, rises. In these uh, age, uh, gender, and body mass index match controls, we saw that there's a delay in that rise in pH. So there is some bicarbonate secretion, even in pancreatic insufficient patients. But it just isn't as much as one would want. And it can take um, you know, up to 20 or 25 minutes for that pH to get above this very minimal uh, pH level uh, optimum and even up to a half an hour. 
before you see uh, pH rising to a normal physiologic level. So we saw some wonderful work yesterday presented about ways to modify CFTR. And since CFTR drives bicarbonate secretion both directly and indirectly, the question is, could a drug such as Ivacaftor, which activates CFTR, change bicarbonate secretion? And there's some reasons to think that that may be true, because remember, bicarbonate secretion comes from the duct. And although the pancreatic acinar tissue is atretic, so we may not be able to bring back, quote unquote, uh, enzyme production, what about fluid production and neutralization in the GI tract? Well, on this MRI, you can see that although in the white area where the arrows are pointing, the, the pancreas is uh, uh, replaced by uh, fat and is atretic, but you can see this black line behind it, the duct is still present. Pathologic studies on autopsy shows that the duct is there in patients with CF. And in some physiologic studies that were done a while ago, um, as I mentioned, pancreatic insufficient patients have decreased bicarbonate secretion, but there is still some secretion that's there. In addition, the submucosal glands are still present. They're plugged with this eosinophilic material. But just as we talk about airway clearance in the lungs, if we could uh, move those secretions, perhaps then we could get gland function. So here's some data from the goal study. Dr. Rowe showed some of it to you yesterday. But here are individuals with CF before taking Ivacaftor, again with this low pH, in this case not getting up above 5.5 until almost a half an hour, bouncing up and down because, as you can see, the number of subjects here is smaller than in the previous study. But here are those same individuals after Ivacaftor where the pH rises into that normal range uh, fairly rapidly and increases throughout the GI tract. And it's very similar to this pattern that we saw in healthy individuals without CF. So to us, this is very um, encouraging evidence that, in fact, this systemic drug, Ivacaftor, changes CFTR action in, uh, in multiple organ systems. And it's possible that this may be the reason why we've seen this wonderful weight gain in individuals on Ivacaftor. It's also the first time that this new tool has been used, and it's a tool that's out there and available for studying other drugs as well. Well, let's talk about the earliest consequences of uh, CF, and they are gastrointestinal. Uh, so here is uh, from an autopsy of an older patient, you know, a terribly shrunken pancreas with these uh, calcifications. You can, again, see the duct that it's there. Here are some plugs taken from a baby with meconium ileus, that thick, sticky mucus that gets stuck in the intestine in babies with CF. You can see this is almost a cast of the lining of the intestine and how rubbery these um, terrible, thick secretions are. So what's the ontogeny of these conditions, and how can we study them? Well, we do have some new tools. We have animal models, and we have human infants who are now diagnosed early in life. So GI, what do you do? You Google infants, so you get some cute pictures. So what have we learned from CF mouse models? What have we learned from CF ferrets and pigs? And what have we learned from CF infants? Well, here are some lessons from CF mice. So CF mice have been available for a long time. And one of the first things that was recognized in CF mice is that they have these terrible bowel obstructions. Here is this plug of uh, uh, thick, inspissated secretions in this almost translucent GI tract from a CF mouse. But uh, interestingly, as most of you are aware, CF mice have normal pancreatic function. Uh, and so one of the things the mouse has told us that we didn't really understand before is that pancreatic insufficiency isn't the cause of meconium ileus. Bowel obstructions occur uh, despite normal pancreatic function. In a very clever model where CFTR can be switched on or switched off differentially in different organ systems, uh, the Hodges group showed that restoration of CFTR action in the intestinal epithelium can eliminate obstruction. 
and because there are a range of CF mouse models, so not just knockout models or F508 DEL models, but a range of different types of mutations have been knocked into CF mice, we've learned that you only need restoration about 10 to 15 percent of CFTR function in the intestine to avoid bowel obstructions. Well, what about ferrets and pigs? Um, about 50 percent of CF ferrets die from meconium ileus um, uh, with perforation in either the ileum or the colon. And CF ferrets um, have mild pancreatic uh, histopathology changes at birth, although they do develop pancreatic insufficiency. CF pigs have 100 percent penetration for both meconium ileus and pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, in the All Things Pancreas Symposium yesterday, we saw a wonderful presentation about the evolution of pancreatic dysfunction in CF pigs, and it really gives us the opportunity to understand in utero how that develops. And it's clear that there's some inflammation in the pancreas that happens early and um, proceeds over time. And um, I, I point you to abstract 180. So what does this mean? It means that meconium ileus is not caused by pancreatic dysfunction, but it is um, associated with it. It's uh, strongly associated with it, and that gives us some clues to intervene uh, in this situation. So I want to talk a little bit about pancreatic function, pancreatic insufficiency, and how we treat it. Um, I've been to uh, two sessions where people have shown sad pictures from old journal articles. Uh, this comes from Harry Schwachman's article in 1960 talking about CF. Um, and, and it just shows how far we've come. You know, we still have a ways to go, but we've come incredibly far. So pancreatic insufficiency uh, can be the first clinical manifestation of CF. Um, many of us have seen newborn screen babies who appear to be normal, and yet they are pancreatic insufficient, gives us an opportunity to treat them in a proactive way. Um, pancreatic insufficiency occurs in the majority of infants and people with CF. It occurs prenatally. Again, the pig model gives us an opportunity to study this. And treatment with pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is life-sustaining. Here is a quote from this article uh, from Dr. Schwachman. You can read it yourself. You can see how far we've come. What we used to tell families about how to treat steatorrhea, this unpleasant and uncomfortable complication of CF. Um, so I reiterate, PERT is a life-sustaining intervention. Babies don't have to die of malnutrition. So we've had some advances in pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, uh, the new drug application process uh, was instituted uh, to help improve pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, a drug that we use lifelong in 90 percent of our patients. Um, these uh, enzymes are no longer overfilled. They have improved stability, and they're free of enveloped viruses. And there are five delayed release PERTs that are now approved by the United States FDA. Um, these enzymes may, in fact, be more efficacious in a narrower therapeutic range than uh, previously thought, and I point you to abstract 447. Well, there are some complications of pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, we all have heard about fibrosing colonopathy. This is a diagram of a cross-section of the intestine with this uh, light pink area being the submucosa, and here is this greatly expanded submucosa filled, filled with fibrosis. Here's an example of a barium enema a nor in a normal individual with these normal haustral markings, and here's a barium enema of an individual with fibrosin colonopathy that has the sort of burnt-out lead pipe look of someone with uh, chronic inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, unfortunately, fibrosin colonopathy has not gone away. This is data from the CF registry. So here is the initial uh, period of time in the early 1990s with the uh, epidemic of fibrosin colonopathy, but data taken from the registry shows that there are still cases over time. So they're rare, they're not common, but for these six individuals, that's a devastating complication that we should try to avoid. So there is a phase four surveillance study for fibrosin colonopathy that will go on over the course of 10 years because it's such a rare complication. The CF Foundation is always at the forefront of things, um, and uh, Dr. Bruce Marshall and others worked very hard to bring three 
competing drug companies together to do the right thing for patients with CF so that we have one unified protocol and we can understand this complication. Another unknown about pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is what's the right dose? Uh, especially in babies. We now are treating babies with pancreatic enzymes at a very young age. And so in the baby observational nutrition or bonus study, there is a sub-study in which we are going to try to understand whether lower dose or higher dose enzymes within the uh, range that we normally recommend are equally efficacious or not. I do want to mention bonus and some other growth investigations that are going on in the first year of life. So bonus will also help us understand factors that influence growth in that first year of life, a critical time, and we know that growth early in life uh, is highly correlated with lung function later in life. Another collaboration uh, with uh, the NIH is the first study, and this will explore breastfeeding and respiratory infections and growth in the first two years of life. I want to mention the DHA study. Uh, which went on for many years and was really the first study looking at uh, newborn screen babies. And this was a study to explore the effects of docosahexaenoic acid on infants um, and, and its effect on pancreatic function. And the, in these um, nutritional level supplementation, so not a pharmacologic level supplementation, but a nutritional level of supplementation, there was no difference in the primary endpoint between the two groups. But in this study, fecal elastase, a measure of pancreatic function, was measured once a month in a prospective way. And it gives us an opportunity to understand that evolution of pancreatic dysfunction in the first year of life. So fecal elastase is unaffected by oral pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. And a level above 200 micrograms per gram is consistent with pancreatic sufficiency. So these data are in press and about to be published in the Journal of Pediatrics. I want to thank Brian O'Sullivan and his group for sharing them today. So some of the babies, 13 of the babies for whom we had uh, data points, enough data points to study, started in the pancreatic sufficient range with a fecal elastase above 200 micrograms per gram. And 10 of those babies ended the year pancreatic sufficient with a fecal elastase of 200 micrograms per gram. Uh, this is just a schematic diagram. Four of them kind of dropped down, but ultimately ended up in that pancreatic sufficient range. Three of them evolved from uh, the PS range to a level less than 180, so evolving pancreatic insufficiency over time, perhaps an opportunity for us to intervene and prevent that problem. Well, what about the group that started with a fecal elastase at less than 200? Well, 31 of them were less than 200, stayed less than 200, never popped around, and mostly those were babies with an initial fecal elastase less than 50. Uh, 13 of them kind of popped around, up and down, but ended the year at less than 200. Again, this is an opportunity for us to intervene. Maybe we can change that curve to an upward direction. Uh, one ended up between 200 and 220. It's a little bit hard to know if we measured that baby a month later, if that was just sort of a later evolution of um, this dysfunction. Interestingly enough, three babies had a fecal elastase that started low and ended up greater than 220. Three of them were greater than 300 micrograms per gram, so not even at the borderline. I want to point out, two of these babies were F508 del homozygotes. So what we think we understand, we don't necessarily totally understand. On the other hand, this is a group of patients, and there are 4% of the babies who had fecal elastase in our registry uh, who also are F508, who had a fecal elastase above 200 in our registry who are also F508 del homozygotes. Maybe we can understand something about modifier genes or other things that will help us sort out this disease. So why do fecal elastase levels change early in life? Well, high levels go to low levels because pancreatic dysfunction evolves. And other groups have shown that before, uh, the group from Colorado. Um, and, um, and again, as I said, this is an opportunity for us to modify disease. But I want people to understand why low levels might go to high. And that's because fecal elastase can either measure primary or secondary pancreatic insufficiency. So when you eat and things go down this little um, one-directional tube, 
fats, peptides, and amino acids stimulate the enteroendocrine cells along the lining of the intestine to release CCK, that enzyme that works on the uh, submucosal glands to, uh, to secrete their granules with enzymes. And so anything that's an insult to the intestinal mucosa will cause elastase levels to be low. The classic example is celiac disease, where you have a flat mucosa. Those patients who are untreated will have a low fecal elastase. If you put them on a gluten-free diet and their intestinal villi regenerate, their fecal elastase becomes normal. You'll see the same thing in, for example, uh, patients after a transplant who have uh, intestinal uh, um, uh, dysfunction and uh, mucosal damage. So um, our recommendation is that fecal elastase be measured at one year of age because there may be some babies who we start on pancreatic enzymes who really don't need to remain on them and we shouldn't treat people with a drug that they don't need. And the other point I want to bring out is a baby who's failing to thrive with CF, even with a low fecal elastase, is not necessarily pancreatic insufficient. All right, let's move on. Let's uh, garner a little intelligence about how we could learn some other things about uh, infants in the first year of life. So I um, got these um, help from some uh, babies. This one's saying, please don't draw my blood. I'm listening to my iPod. I don't get away from me. This one's looking at the iPad saying, come on, there must be some way to measure biomarkers without having to hurt us. Well, this one's saying, not iPod, not iPad, but I pooed. And so let's talk a little bit about baby poo. Um, it gives us the opportunity to look at the fecal microbiome. So microbiomics is the study of interactive symbiosis. And there are multiple microbiomes in the body, in the nasal cavity, oral cavity, skin, the lungs, which we didn't really understand before, um, the GI and the GU tracts. But the GI tract certainly has the uh, greatest uh, amount of bacteria. The human intestine is colonized with 100 trillion bacteria, um, more than we could ever culture. And so microbiomics is a technique to understand those bacteria without having to culture them all individually. Why do we have those bacteria? Well, they promote optimal digestion. They maintain epithelial homeostasis. They modulate fat metabolism. They promote angiogenesis and enteric nerve function to help with peristalsis. They support resistance to infection. And dysbiosis, or a change in the normal uh, balance of flora in the body, has been associated in both humans and animal models with a range of uh, diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, even obesity, cancer, diabetes, and allergy. Microbiomic techniques use the 16S ribosomal RNA to be able to understand what the bacteria are without having to culture them all. And the data are analyzed in terms of the relative abundance, uh, the diversity and richness of these different genera, the presence or absence of taxa, the evenness or distribution, and the total bacterial load. And um, there is a symposium, Symposium 10, looking at these techniques to understand uh, some issues related to the microbiome. Uh, there are a variety of uh, bacterial uh, communities in mammalian intestine. Uh, this comes from an article from 2009 showing that even um, within the intestine in different specialized areas, you see a different predominance of uh, bacteria. But we can study the whole intestinal fecal microbiome by studying stool, and babies will provide it easily. Here's some data from Luke Hoffman's lab at the University of Washington looking at patients without CF and those with CF and uh, the phylum distribution of bacteria. You probably can't see it well, but this little tiny uh, turquoise sliver is proteobacteria, which don't occur very often in people without CF, but it's greatly expanded in people with CF. And what are proteobacteria? They're gram-negative rods, the things that we see early in babies with CF, uh, and pseudomonas. Um, and I point you to abstract 326 for more uh, information. We're all familiar with this, the evolution of uh, the uh, different types of bacteria in the respiratory tract, at least the ones that we can culture. We're going to learn more by microbiomics of the, of the airways. But what about uh, the evolution 
of the, the GI microbiome and how might that be related to the respiratory microbiome. So there is a correlation between the fecal and the respiratory microbiomes. In this uh, study uh, by Madden et al., seven infants with CF diagnosed by newborn screen were followed for nine to 21 months. 14 of the 16 genera increasing in the gut were also increasing in the respiratory tract. And for seven of these 16, gut colonization came before respiratory tract colonization. I'm going to show you a diagram that's a little complicated, but I want to walk you through it because it's really very revealing. So uh, in this diagram, the darker colors in this column represent earlier uh, in life, and the lighter uh, are samples collected later in life. The green bars uh, going across are samples that come from the GI tract, and the blue bars come from the respiratory tract. And what you can see for this group is that early on, you see these, so early on with the dark bars from the GI tract, you see uh, these uh, different uh, 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 genera, and later in life, those exact same genera, the same columns, so uh, later in life, the lighter bars from the respiratory tract, they're appearing there. Very powerful. And um, I point you to abstract 279 for more information. Well, the GI and the respiratory tract have these commonalities. They are selective epithelial barriers with a mucus gel layer that protects them against bacteria, against uh, pathogens, against foreign antigens, and they also have mucosal associated lymphoid tissue to regulate antigen sampling, uh, lymphocyte tra trafficking, and mucosal host defense. And so it's likely that there's a connection between these in people with CF as there is in other situations. And you can see from this quote that those similarities between the GI and the respiratory tract likely are the reason that we see this interaction between these two systems that have similar histology and similar uh, uh, physiology. So let's go inside um, and take a look inside the GI tract. Um, there is inflammation, and that inflammation can arise in uh, response to dysbiosis um, the, of intestinal bacteria, and that can lead to inflammation uh, through just direct signaling from bacteria, through toll-like receptors, nod-like receptors, and G-protein-coupled pro uh, receptors. This inflammation can be uh, measured clinically with lab tests, and you can see one example of that in Abstract 522. And it can also be uh, looked at or examined with video endoscopy with a different capsule that has um, a little camera on it. And three days ago, I got a uh, note that the given capsule company, one of the video capsule uh, makers, has bought out SmartPill, the company that makes the pH capsule. So we may have a very powerful way to study both things at the same time with one capsule. So here is a... Here is a um, a video capsule endoscopy of normal jejunum. You can see these pretty folds, almost looks like velvet, the little villi sticking up. And here's an example from an individual with cystic fibrosis where there's um, uh, cracking, fissuring, a lot of uh, uh, mucus, um, thicker uh, folds, and those are uh, examples of, um, of the kind of inflammation you can see. And I, I thank Michael Wilshansky, and I uh, point you to Abstract 510. Well, another way to go inside is to grab a piece of intestine. So I'm going to conclude by talking about uh, two different uh, preclinical model systems and uh, some ways that we can use them as biomarkers. So one is rectal short circuit current measurements, also called ICM, and the other is a way to take a piece of intestine and create something called organoids. So rectal tissue can be used as a biomarker and a preclinical model system for CFTR. This was initially based on European experience. Many people in this room uh, put in many hours trying to develop these techniques. Uh, the TDN has uh, sponsored a standard operating procedure, so now this can be used in a standardized way. One can do a suction biopsy or a direct biopsy. And this is a suction biopsy uh, piece of equipment. Um, this is a little flexible tube that's uh, put in the anus. It has a side hole, and when you pull back on this uh, syringe, 
it creates some suction, so it sucks a little piece of tissue in, then there's a little guillotine that chops it off, and then you, you pull the tube out. If you're above the anal verge, this is painless, and it can be done without anesthesia, and it's a standard procedure done in infants to screen for Hirschsprung's disease. So uh, if you can do it in infants, you can do it in, well, anyone except maybe teenagers. Um, so the advantages are uh, rectal tissue is accessible. Uh, there's high expression of CFTR in rectal tissue, and if you can get a piece of tissue, you can do multiple ex vivo assessments. So you could apply reagents that aren't suitable for use in vivo so that you can learn more about CFTR function. Um, you can apply agents either to the apical side or to the basal side if you want to think about systemic uh, delivery of drugs. And you can do a variety of measurements. You can do short circuit um, uh, current measurements, biochemistry, metabolomics, et cetera. Um, and uh, I point you to Abstract 210 to learn more about suction rectal biopsies. Uh, the uh, colonocyte ion transport is just a little bit different than the airway transport. There is this potassium uh, secretory pathway, so electrophysiologists need to be aware of that. And the colon is an absorptive cell, so it has more chloride secretion than airway cells. And, um, I thank Hugo de Jong for this, uh, as well as uh, J.P. Clancy, who uh, shared these slides with me. So here is a standard uh, rectal short circuit current measurement recording. Um, I want to show you that these uh, axes are a little bit different. So between 50 and 100 is the baseline, both for individuals with CF and for healthy controls. These um, are four tracings, each from one a person without CF and one person with CF, so the same uh, subject. And when you apply indomethacin, amylaride, forskolin with IBMX, uh, carbacol, and bumetanide, you get a pattern. Um, and you can see that the CFTR response is clearly different in the individuals with CF, with uh, decreased response to uh, the uh, forskolin and IBMX stimulation, and a mixed response to carbacol because of the potassium transport that's seen in the absence of CFTR activity. Um, I point you to Abstracts 175 and 256 to learn more about this very powerful tool. Another thing about intestinal current measurements is that there's a genotype-phenotype relationship. And so as we've seen with uh, sweat chloride, uh, this can be a powerful tool. So in this, uh, in this diagram from uh, Hertz et al. in Gastroenterology 2004, the solid lines are the median and the dashed lines are the 25th and 75th percentiles. But in the controls, to the carriers, to the patients with CF who are pancreatic sufficient, to the people who are pancreatic insufficient, you can see this very clear uh, correlation. Uh, before I get to this, I just want to say there are incredible advantages of being able to take uh, rectal tissue, and especially in this era of personalized medicine. So you could study each, you know, you could study rare mutations, and you could study each individual uh, by getting direct tissue for each individual. It's a very powerful tool. Again, it gives us the opportunity to have tissue and use it ex vivo in a way that we might not be able to do otherwise. But it's truly a powerful tool for the personalized part of CF uh, care. And as we saw yesterday, we have people with rarer and rarer mutations, and we need new tools to be able to study them, and this is a powerful one. Well, let me uh, end by talking about organoids, enteroids, or colonoids. They're all different words for a uh, similar thing. And uh, the NIH actually put together a symposium to talk about nomenclature for this evolving field. But they are primary cultures that can express a crypt and or luminal domains. The LGR5 plus cells at the base of the crypts are these totipotent cells that generate all the cell types in the cryptophilus axis. So if you can kind of get a sense of it, this is kind of the intestinal mucosa with these little crypts that go down, and the uh, LGR5 cells are here at the bottom. But there is this continuum in this axis up to the tips of the villi that stick up from the intestinal mucosa. Uh, 
the use of this technique can help you understand crypt secretory physiology, especially in an integrated cell environment because there are different types of cells that are there in the crypt. And so if you study one cell by itself, you may not understand how it interacts or crosstalks with other cells. And you can understand luminal absorptive physiology. And these uh, organoids have been created from uh, mouse intestine, from human intestine, and from uh, mouse and human embryonic stem cells. Uh, these uh, crypt cultures are in 3D cells, uh, gels, and you can see that in this cartoon that what you get is you get a lumen inside where you've got a villus domain to understand secret, uh, the secretory part of it, and you have a crypt, uh, excuse me, the absorptive part, and you, under, and you have a crypt domain where you can understand the secretory portion. And here's a, a picture uh, from a paper by Sato et al. in Nature. Uh, the other thing about enteroids is they isolate intestinal epithelium from microbial populations and from systemic factors that might be affecting how CFTR works. So, for example, one change uh, that is caused by the microbial environment is goblet cell hyperplasia. In the Everything Pancreas uh, Symposium yesterday, we understood that uh, perhaps uh, cell hyperplasia in the pancreas also is something that comes more uh, from environmental sources than directly from CFTR dysfunction. But there are some changes that are intrinsic to dysfunctional CFTR. For example, hyperproliferation. There's some suggestion that this may be caused by alkaline pH, and hyperproliferation is a very important thing for us to study because as our population is aging, we are seeing an increasing number of GI tract cancers, and we need to understand that better. Um, in addition, you can study the goblet cell degranulation defect that in CFTR, in cells with uh, dysfunctional CFTR, the mucus that's released stays uh, uh, attached to the goblet cells. It stays in these little thick granules. And um, this is a work that was published by Liu et al. And um, I also want to thank uh, Lane Clark and his uh, lab in Missouri for uh, this and the next slide. So here is an example of uh, an organoid with goblet cell degranulation after carbacol. And you can see these uh, granules, and uh, they, uh, they slowly uh, kind of degranulate and come up to the cell surface, which is a little tough to see in this uh, video. But in the CF knockout mouse, these granules um, kind of stay intact, and when they go into the lumen, they don't dissolve. And why is that uh, technique important to us? That technique, and uh, again, abstract 122, to understand a little bit more about this uh, important work. And why is it important? just getting back to the similarities between these two tracts. Um, this is a quote from Dr. Jeff Wine. The submucosal gland contains the elixir of airway health. Um, because those submucosal glands in the airways, this is uh, 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 from uh, Jeff Wine's work, you can see that similar branching pattern, similar to uh, the pancreas, similar to other organs. And those mucin granules, when they are released, release their um, their uh, antimicrobial peptides. There are a variety of abstracts talking about uh, uh, submucosal uh, gland granule uh, dissolution, and they are both in the GI tract and in the airway tract. These organoids give us a very powerful way to understand uh, degranulation. Well, I'm going to conclude by uh, showing you another exciting uh, uh, way that we can use organoids. And I uh, thank Dr. Beekman uh, and Dr. Deckers and their lab in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands for sharing these videos. But here are some healthy human organoids. And um, they normally are, uh, you know, secrete fluid. And you can see the expansion of those cells. And I'll just show it to you one more time so you get a chance to see in the resting state. Uh, and then with forskolin, uh, they are secreting fluid. Here's some F508 del, F508 del organoids, and when stimulated with forskolin, you know, there's a little something going on in there, but not much. And I, just because it's a brief video, I'm going to run it for you one more time. Not much happening. I do have to point out there are slightly different scales in these uh, different videos. 
But here, the most exciting thing is here's F508 Del, F508 Del organoids treated with uh, VX809 overnight and then uh, given VX770 and forskolin. Oh my goodness, hang on here. Uh, and given forskolin. And here you can see this rapid swelling. And I'm going to just show it to you one more time because it's cool. There they are, stimulated with VX770 and forskolin. So um, this group has also shown that you can uh, uh, quantitate this and see differences uh, in uh, these are human tissues, severe CF, mild CF, and healthy controls. Uh, so uh, this gives us a quantitative tool perhaps to study drugs uh, and a variety of different drugs and maybe even taking uh, intestinal biopsies from people with unusual mutations and being able to study drugs in them. So I point you to abstract 191 uh, to learn more about this exciting technique. So coming close to the end, I hope you can generalize some insights about the GI tract and understand that there are similarities between the GI tract and the respiratory tract. I hope that um, those of you in each of the two different fields will understand that we can uh, use similar tools uh, to help us uh, all move CF care uh, forward. So CFTR dysfunction causes pathology in both the respiratory and the GI tracts through this uh, cycle of infection, obstruction, and inflammation. That animal models and techniques used to explore one system can lend insights to another. And that's really what the CF Foundation does, is to bring people together to use techniques and tools um, that they might not have thought about otherwise and that treatments that focus on CFTR modulation, that uh, incredible wealth of information that we saw yesterday, are likely to improve GI as well as respiratory tract function, and that will improve quality of life for our patients. So with that, Jean, I think this is the end. Thank you very much.